Thank you, Jim, for helping us prepare for worship, and good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Bethel. We are happy that we can be together to hear God's word, which has a great message for us today and every day. I want to say a word of welcome, especially to you if you are visiting this morning. It is our great pleasure to have you here, and it is our hope that you feel at home here at Bethel. A few announcements for you. Bethel Men's Ministry will meet next Sunday, August 20th, for a family cookout at the Wall House. Please let Pastor Wall know if you're planning to come. That's next Sunday, August 20th. It's hard to believe, but Sunday School and Confirmation are right around the corner. Our registrations are open for these still, and we ask that if you have children uh, and youth who want to be a part of this or who you want to be a part of these great programs, please uh, get them registered online. And also, if you have been visiting and would like to become an official member of Bethel, we would love that. We have a great process, uh, and we have new member orientation 101 starting up this September. Uh, you can get a hold of Sherry Kallenbach, who is our new member coordinator, to get the ball rolling. That's all I have for announcements for you. There are many more in your bulletin that you can check out. Uh, but I wanted to invite a uh, representative for uh, Bethel Women to uh, speak on behalf of the women of the ELCA Triennial. Well, it seems appropriate we have three women for the Triennial. All right, very good. We're happy to hear what God is up to and what, uh, how he's using you uh, in celebrating Bethel Women and the women of the ELCA. On a beautiful weekend in July, seven women from Bethel joined over 3,300 Lutheran women from across the United States and even a few from other countries at the 10th Triennial Women's Convention in Minneapolis. We would like to share a small piece of our experiences there. At this triennial gathering, ELCA women pastors from the United States and other countries led the worship services and workshops. The international women pastors who participated came from India and several other countries in Africa and Central America. All of us who attended the convention had the opportunity to attend any of 14 different workshops. Workshop topics included Bible study, social injustice, homelessness, sex trafficking, making global connections, discipleship, and peace at the end of life. One workshop I attended was Gifts of Discipleship. There we talked about how we can live out these gifts of discipleship in our daily life by proclaiming the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, by serving all people following God, Jesus' example, and by striving for justice and peace around the world. I would like to highlight a session that I attended called Peace at the Last. <clears throat> I thought it was so meaningful. Peace at the Last is a liturgy for the dying, which was written by Pastor Paul Palumbo from Chelan, Washington. It's intended to bring beauty and grace to the bedside of the dying person. It is a collection of liturgical responses, prayers, psalms, poems, and music. It also allows for periods of silence. It offers the peace of Christ to the dying person and the grieving family. Pastor Palumbo, in his setting, trained a small team of people from his congregation to go and requested to the bedside and conduct this liturgy with the family gathered there. It is a form of ministry that we could also offer to our fellow members when they are in one of the most difficult times of their lives. I was so grateful to know about this liturgy that's available and uh, it's available to all of the church and therefore also to me. The workshops that I attended dealt with writing, dealing with shame, 
and an intercultural diversity index that's available to corporations. Uh, but the biggest impact for me was realizing that so many women, not just across the United States, but throughout the world, share the same dreams, goals, joys, and concerns. This awesome group of women includes you. The 2020 Triennial Gathering will be held in Phoenix, Arizona. While we wait for that to arrive, check out the opportunities for Bible study and fellowship that are listed in your bulletin. And one last thing. As a member of the Women's Board, I would personally like to invite you to attend the Southeast Minnesota Synodical Women's Organization Convention on September 16th at St. Olaf Lutheran Church in Austin, Minnesota. More information for that convention can be found in your bulletin or on the Bethel Women Bulletin Board in the narthex. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate the work that God is doing through you every day and hearing about the Triennial Gathering, especially this morning. I invite the congregation now to stand as you are able and greet those around you with a good morning and a peace of Christ. Good morning. indeed in the peace of Christ that we are gathered and we can readily share that with each other and what a great pleasure to be able to do so and we can continue that after the service of course but I invite you to, to uh, remain standing as we confess our sins and hear the source of this peace which is God's forgiveness in our lives we're gathered today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit amen, amen. almighty God to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we are capable to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear. And preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe believe in me, and where I am, there you shall be, and you shall know the
and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Let not your heart be troubled, you believe My father's house, there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. I go. A reading from 1 Kings. At Horeb, the mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I am alone and left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after a fi the fire the sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king of Aram, and you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elijah, son of Zephat, and Abel Molhala as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the word of Hazael, Jehu shall kill him. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elijah shall kill. Yet... I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Also, our psalm for today is Psalm 85, and we will sing it responsively. I will sing the refrain once, and then I ask that you also sing it with me. Love 
against each other. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And very early in the morning, he came walking on the sea toward them. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out with fear. But Jesus immediately spoke to them and said, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But, but when he noticed the strong wind beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, children are welcome for the children's word. <clears throat> Cradling children in his arms. Good to have you here this morning. Do you remember yesterday? Was it a nice day yesterday? Did you play outside yesterday? No? No. What did you do outside yesterday? Played on a swing set. Swings, swings is a big deal. I was on a golf course, but I wasn't golfing. I was doing a wedding, which was actually very fun too. It was between two holes, and, you know, I kind of wondered, but... We were good. No little golf balls rolled through our wedding. Uh, today's a nice day. I think today, 
I understand that maybe a little later today it m might not be quite so not. In fact, I... Can you hear that? Might not fit everybody. Do you have umbrellas at your house? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do they help keep you dry in the midst of a storm? Sometimes it's good protection for us. There are other storms in our life too. And Jesus can be that protection. Jesus is kind of like an umbrella. Now you can take this umbrella, I suppose, anywhere. You could use it in storms. You could even use it to keep bright sunlight off of you. But there's someone that you can bring everywhere you go. And no matter what storms in life you might have, there is a Jesus who always has promised to put out his hand and say, have no fear. I am your loving Jesus. Thanks for coming and worshiping Jesus today. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Just last week, the longest walking bridge in the world opened. It covers a Swiss valley and is 540 yards long. That is almost five and a half football fields. You can see a pretty stunning picture of part of that bridge on the boards right now. Walking over this bridge is not for the faint of heart. It is only two feet wide and lends itself to single file walking. What might be worse for some is the fact that you can actually see through the bottom of this bridge. Below, as much as a football field, you can see the floor of the valley. Some of us would shudder to pass or meet someone on this narrow bridge. Now, it could be worse. It could be walking on water in a storm at a time of the day where darkness is just mixing with light to create shadows and you can't actually see what is going on. Last week we heard from the Gospels the tremendous story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and likely thousands more. As is common for Jesus in the Gospels, after he has had an intense time with a lot of people, he seeks times of solitude. So he dismisses the crowds and he sends the disciples on the boat to the other side of the, of the Sea of Galilee. Now it has always seems strange to me in this story that the disciples do not question this plan. Master, uh, do you want somebody to stay with you? Master, uh, if we take the boat, how are you going to get to the other side of the sea? Uh, Master, would you like us to come back tomorrow to uh, pick you up? But none of that. Instead, the disciples just get into the boat and they go off and leave Jesus there alone. And he goes up by himself on the mountain to pray. As the Sea of Galilee is wont to do, it whips up a big storm. At least four of the people on the boat that we know of are professional sailors, fishermen. You, you would think that these men would be able to handle any of the circumstances they might find on the Sea of Galilee. Yet very early in the morning, Jesus comes walking toward them on the water, but they do not know it is Jesus. They believe it is a ghost. It's starting to sound like a Stephen King novel. A dark and stormy night.
ghosts walking on the water. Uh, the disciples must be hoping that the worst problem they will ever have is trying to find food for 5,000 people. Well, Jesus calms their fears with a word. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And then it is the bold Peter. It is always Peter who addresses Jesus first. And he asks Jesus to bid him come to Jesus on the water. Jesus says, come. Apparently, this works for at least a little bit. It says that Peter gets out and starts walking toward Jesus on the water. It doesn't say that he threw his leg over the side of the boat and immediately sunk like a rock. Was it his focus on faith and on Jesus that allowed him those first few steps that conquered the water? But then fear enters the story for the second time. Peter notices the storm and he begins to sink. This is a tremendous story, exciting story. It's a story that has captivated the attention of people through all the ages. Even the humorist Mark Twain took note of the story on a time in which he was in the Holy Land with his wife. One night on that trip, they stayed at a resort on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It was an especially beautiful night with a full moon over the sea, making it particularly romantic. So the Twains decided they would like a moonlit ride on the lake. Twain approached one of the local fishermen to see how much it would cost to take the boat out onto the lake for a ride. The fisherman took note of Twain's white suit, hat, shirt, shoes, and presumed him to be a rich man. And he said, for you, my friend, $25. Now that was in a day when $25 was real money. In today's money, that would be $530. Now Twain knew that $530 was too much for a boat ride. So he turned away from the fisherman Walking away, he muttered to himself, I always wondered why Jesus walked. Now I know why. <laughs> well, Peter was willing to walk on the sea out of his courage. It was inspiring that he was able to do what so many could not. Lots of other inspiring stories. Perhaps one about a young woman named Malala. Maybe you have not heard of her or you have forgotten about her story. In 2009, she became a blogger for the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC. Malala wanted people to know what life was like under the Taliban in Pakistan. In 2011, the Taliban passed uh, an edict against education for all girls and women. That infuriated Malala, and so this edict became a frequent target in her blogs. In October 2012, some Taliban thugs boarded a school bus that Malala was riding and shot her in the head point blank. Of course, the bullet should have killed her. It did not. Instead, she survived. She did more than survive. She became an even more ardent supporter of education for girls and women around the world. She has been recognized globally for her courage, receiving both a nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize and an invitation to speak to the United Nations on her 16th birthday about the importance of education. That's courage. That's inspiring. There's a wonderful story about a famous evangelist years ago named Peter Cartwright. 
the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, was going to visit his church one day, and the elders of the church wanted to make sure that Cartwright did not say anything that would offend the President. Those were days in which the American president could seriously affect the fortunes of any particular denomination or church, and the elders did not want to risk the president being mad at them, so they went to the preacher and just wanted to make sure that he would not say anything offensive to the president. They were wasting their breath. As Peter Cartwright stood up that morning, the first words out of his mouth were, I understand that President Andrew Jackson is here this morning. I have been warned to be very guarded in my remarks. Let me say this. Andrew Jackson will be condemned unless he repents of his sin. The whole congregation just gasped. This is no way to talk about a president, though some might have found it refreshing. Andrew Jackson at the end of the service, met the preacher at the end and looked him in the eye and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could conquer the world. Now, whether preacher Peter Cartwright was right about or wrong about uh, Andrew Jackson, he was convinced that he needed to speak the word of truth that he knew. It was courageous for him, and he could speak out because of his courage. He was willing to walk on dangerous waters. Peter was willing to walk on dangerous waters and succeeded for a bit. Jesus was disappointed in Peter. As he reaches out his hand to save him from the raging waters, he calls Peter a man of little faith. When they get back into the boat, the wind ceases, and the disciples on the boat worship him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Seems like all the doubt has been erased. Well, what about us in the year 2017? Is Jesus calling us in the middle of a storm to step off the pontoon in the middle of Lake Zumbro and make our way to the shore? That doesn't seem very likely. Is Jesus calling us to challenge the Taliban well, from our relatively remote and safe perches in Rochester, Minnesota? That isn't terribly likely either. Is Jesus calling us to be courageous and speak out for the faith? Well, that one is yes. That one is a definite yes. That courage will not give us the ability to walk on water, but that courage will help us experience peace within the midst of the storm. That courage will bring us to the point where we worship with the disciples, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Uh, there are times in our lives where storms threaten to overpower us. There may even be times where we think Jesus is a ghost. There are times in which we live in fear. But there is no storm, ghost, or fear that can match the power of the one who can walk on water. The one who reaches out his hand to us in the middle of a storm and says, Peace. It is I. That is one worthy of worship. That is the one we proclaim to the nations. Truly, the Son of God. Amen. Hymn 763, please rise and sing.
us boldly confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come to us to the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Christ. Amen. Let us pray for the Church, the world, and all in need. O oh God, our ruler, continue to send out your church on earth to be light and salt to the world. Keep giving us the heart to do your work. And when we are in need, Lord, help us to trust that you are there to support us and offer us what we need from day to day. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, our Redeemer, inspire leaders with the righteousness that comes from faith so that your justice thrives throughout the world. Bless the efforts of this week's Rochester mission trip to bring kindness, grace, and needed support to those many organizations in our community who daily serve the basic needs of others. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O God, our sustainer, comfort those who are lonely, fearful, or burdened by doubt. Give meaningful work to those who seek employment. Walk with those who are ill or recovering, especially Dwayne Jedlam and others whom we know to be in need this day. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O God, our encourager, empower this assembly to boldly proclaim and live out your love to all who long to hear a word of hope. Equip us to use our hands, our feet, our voices, our minds to share the blessings you have given us. Bless the newly married Angela and Tim Hudson and Ryan and Nicole Iverson with a lifetime of abiding love. And bless the newly baptized Aria May, Gianna Jean, and Eva May with great joy in the gift of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O oh God, our Savior, we rejoice in the example of the saints who have gone before us until we join them around your throne. Be with Val Holling as she grieves the death of her father and brother, and comfort the family of Ron Zwicker with your presence and your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we place all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, trusting in the mercy of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Be seated as we gather this morning's gifts.
Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. We bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.